cash and voucher assistance for protection. I'm just going to give you a few housekeeping notes before I hand over to our moderator. So please, if you already are not on mute, please do keep yourselves on mute unless you're going to be asking a question or speaking later on. We'd also ask that those of you who are not presenters, please kindly turn off your videos so that we can see the speakers. If you want to make any, question, uh, make any comments or questions throughout, please feel free to use the chat box. Otherwise, you can also, during the Q&A period, raise your hand by hovering over your name and then raising your hand and then we can call upon you. And for your information, we are going to be recording the event in the hopes that we can share it with you later on. With those notes, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our event today, Mr. Andreas Papa Constantino, sorry, who is the Director of Neighborhood and Middle East in the European Commission with DG Echo. Andreas, I'm going to pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manisha. Uh, colleagues, uh, welcome to the launch of the stock uh, taking uh, stock taking paper on cash for protection. Uh, this event today is co-hosted by the European Union, DG ECHO, uh, UNHCR, the IRC, International Rescue Committee, and uh, the Women's Refugee Commission, WRC. This uh, stock-taking paper is a very welcome first product from the new task team on cash for protection of the Global Protection Cluster. We are glad to support its launch today and co-host this event. The European Union is strongly committed to uh, enhancing the use of cash to deliver uh, humanitarian assistance whenever safe, of course, feasible and appropriate. This is in line with our grand bargain commitments. And also the EU is committed to support protection, one of the most important humanitarian uh, sectors for which uh, DG uh, ECHO is a donor. The stock taking paper is a very welcome first contribution to our collective learning on cash for protection. The paper, amongst other things, highlights the role that cash can play to reaffirm the dignity of individuals and communities something that is central to humanitarian aid. And as we all know, the protection sector is frequently not a prioritized sector at the onset of humanitarian crises. We hope that this new area of work on cash and protection is an opportunity to include protection in our efforts to enhance the efficiency of humanitarian aid. I look forward to hear today about next steps and particularly uh, how they per pertain to partners in the field. During the first part of this launch event, we will be hearing from um, distinguished representatives from UNHCR, WRC, UNFPA and IRC, who will highlight the importance of using cash for protection and will elaborate on the conclusions of the stock taking paper. After this, the participants will have an, an opportunity to ask questions or provide comments uh, live or uh, in the chat. Uh, please note that Manisha from WRC will lead this part, the second part of the event. Um, and now let's get started. Uh, UNHCR's uh, Gillian Triggs unfortunately had to apologize and is replaced today by Grania O'Hara, Director, uh, Division of International Protection at UNHCR, who will be uh, the keynote speaker. Please note that uh, Grania will need to leave immediately after uh, her speech, but her colleagues uh, Bernadette and William will be available to answer any questions during the Q&A session. Um, Grania, it's very good to have you here today with us. Uh, you are representing the, the lead agency of the Global Protection Cluster. How will this um, stock taking paper contribute to improved protection outcomes? And how might the evidence uh, that transpires from the paper 
help to increase the use of cash and vouchers in production in protection programming. Thank you and welcome to all concerned. Uh, I hope you can both see and hear me clearly. We're not in a particularly well lit room here. So when we tested the camera, um, it, it looked very much like a silhouette, but we're seeing and hearing everybody else clearly. So I shall press on. And um, let me echo what's been said by our, our moderator chair today. Apologies on, on Gillian's part. Um, she is, as we speak, currently on mission in Greece, and uh, with all the difficulties about travel, it was difficult to predict if that mission would come through on time. So she was glad it did, but she was regretful of the uh, lost opportunity to be with you here today. But stepping in in her stead on an issue on which I have a deep personal interest, because this is an issue uh, uh, to which I've been exposed, um, not only from my current position as director of the Division of International Protection, and in my dual-hatted capacity um, also as uh, the, the lead agency within the cluster, but from my own personal experiences in the field as a protection cluster lead. So when I reviewed um, the, the paper, I was very impressed by its content and its quality. And I would, of course, uh, like to appreciate appreciation for the very strong interagency collaboration that led to the production um, of this paper. I think it's meaningful in its content and its quality because it reflects uh, in a very honest way on a lot of the challenges that we have faced in um, expanding and improving the use of cash as a modality for the delivery of, uh, of protection outcomes. Uh, I think in confidence, uh, knowing that uh, we are a group here that are all committed to the same high standards of use of cash for quality protection uh, outcomes, uh, I think I can venture to say that, that the whole cash arena has not always necessarily been the, the model example of best cooperation on an interagency uh, basis. Um, we've certainly, over the course of recent years, had some battles about the best way to utilize cash. And I think one of the things that the, uh, that the report shows us is how far we have come in being more collegial and in building consensus around the use of cash. I think the other important thing to note is that many of us identify as protection actors, but the important thing to uh, appreciate and acknowledge about cash is it's not exclusively being used in the protection arena. It's being used across all sectors and all of us need to have this common understanding about the use of cash for quality protection outcomes. And um, in saying that, I think we've all acknowledged, and this has been one of the positive steps forward, we have all acknowledged the element of the use of cash that provides a greater degree of independence and dignity to the persons that we seek to serve. But I think there's a balance to be struck also in that equation, because it's not a simple equation of saying, well, we give people cash, therefore they become independent. That's the best way of doing things. Something which has, something which has come out very strongly in the report on that point is looking at the whole interaction between the use of cash in conjunction with other forms of delivery of assistance and how a clear and transparent and honest discussion about that is what is going to contribute most to the, the quality protection outcomes. The acceptance of the fact that we're not speaking about an either or scenario. There are some services for which cash is clearly a more effective modality of delivery. I mean, some which spring to mind, to my mind from personal experience, are around things like direct payment of rent and giving people that sort of, of independence. But we equally have many operational experiences where we know 
that cash alone is not sufficient. We need to maintain and be vigilant about the combination of cash assistance in conjunction with quality services in response to sexual and gender based violence, psychosocial support, and a range of other services which clearly illustrate to us that it's not an either or situation. In terms of how we look at the beneficiaries of cash assistance, that's also an area, and I, I think it's reflected very clearly in this report, and, and the report has, has looked quite closely, specifically around issues of, of gender and child protection. I think it's, it highlights also how important it is for us to remain vigilant on how we go about our selection of beneficiaries when it comes to the delivery of cash or voucher assistance. And to acknowledge that it's not simply an easy exercise of identifying the, the traditional vulnerability criteria and then saying, okay, everybody who is vulnerable should in some way be eligible for cash assistance. And in targeting vulnerabilities, we are responsibly discharging all of our, uh, our protection responsibilities. Because some of the examples that we have had from the field with quite sophisticated uh, methodologies of cash delivery, and the ones with which I am most familiar are those in the Middle East, in particular Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and to a lesser extent Syria, they have also given us a lot of evidence and a lot of food for thought that we can't simply just rely on um, traditional vulnerability criteria. It is a much more sophisticated exercise than that to identify in a, in a precise way who are the most needy beneficiaries and who are those that can make best use of cash assistance. And again, I loop back to the earlier point I made in conjunction with other services, because cash assistance alone, particularly for those with specific vulnerabilities, will clearly not be enough. We cannot just give people cash and assume that with cash they fend for themselves. The collaborative approach that's been reflected in the, uh, in the production of this report has given UNHCR a lot of encouragement and internal impetus to do better on our own agency performance on the use of cash. Um, as we take the lead in at least uh, 23 of the active countries where of, of 24, tw we take the lead on 23 out of 24 fully activated cluster situations and in an additional eight other protection working groups um, functioning in, in IDP interagency mechanisms, we take away from this report and we have uh, reflected on it internally, the importance of us remaining true to our commitment to step up on delivery of, of on the use of cash assistance in compliance with commitments that have been made through the grand bargain and other interagency agreements. That I speak um, with my UNHCR hat on for that. Equally, we take away from the report renewed impetus and a better level of understanding of our responsibility as the cluster lead to continue this collaboration with all of the area of responsibility leads. So I'm referring here to child protection, to GBV, to housing, land and property and mine action and their respective individual leads. I think the work on this report has given us a lot of um, uh, positive impetus to continue forward in all operational settings. I look forward, as I hope that all of the collaborators on this uh, stock taking paper will, to the idea that we will maintain annual updates that will take us forward step by step in deepening our understanding, our commitment and our effectiveness in using uh, cash as a modality of delivery for protection outcomes. I think I shall leave my comments at that. They have been more a series of comments and observations than a, a keynote speech per se, but these were the things that struck me most um, combining my own field experience and a close reading of this report. And I close once again in thanking all of those who have participated not only in the report, but also in pulling together today's event. 
Um, I do have to leave because of a conflicting um, and far less, I assure you, interesting obligation. But I leave you in the good hands of, of William, the Global Protection Cluster Lead, uh, Global Protection Cluster Coordinator, and my deputy, Bernadette Cassell. And there are many other UNHCR colleagues on the call. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Grania, for that. Um, and now uh, we move to our three panelists. We will start with Tenzin uh, Manel, who is the co-chair for the task team on cash for protection, as well as the senior technical advisor for cash and livelihoods at the Women's Refugee Commission. Tenzin, um, what are uh, some of the key obstacles uh, that practitioners face uh, uh, while scaling cash for protection outcomes within the protection sector? What are uh, uh, the, the next steps for this document and how could we uh, help uh, to put it into practice? Thank you so much, Andreas, and thanks to all participants and co-panelists as well. I hope you can hear me and see me okay. It's Love a great you. question. Great. It's a, it's a great question. I'll dive into this in more detail in a moment. But top-line obstacles for practitioners include fundamental knowledge and skills. So while protection actors and cash actors are experts in their respective fields, uh, a basic understanding of the other cohorts methods is central to being able to apply and scale cash for protection. And another challenge is funding, both for the startup costs, which are associated with adopting this approach, and for programs for affected populations. The stock taking paper focuses on cash and voucher assistance, or CVA, for protection outcomes within the protection sector specifically. And as has been mentioned, it's been the collaborative effort among task team members comprising 40 different individuals across 30 different agencies led by WRC and IRC. And foundational to the stock taking paper were evidence maps, which were uh, led jointly and individually by task team members. The paper addresses cash and voucher assistance for child protection, as well as gender-based violence outcomes and future editions of this paper will reflect evidence on cash and voucher assistance for housing, land, and property outcomes, as well as mine action outcomes. So it is a living document, which will be updated annually based on stock taking across all areas of responsibility on an ongoing basis. And then we will develop a position paper. The task team is currently fundraising to be able to provide regional as well as field level capacity building opportunities and also to partner with colleagues on the ground to build more evidence to address the gaps that I'll outline momentarily. So what are the key lessons identified in critical gaps from, from this initiative. The study confirms that cash and voucher assistance has the potential to contribute to positive protection outcomes. And evidence suggests, as has been discussed, that cash and voucher assistance alone is unlikely to achieve meaningful long-term protection outcomes unless cash and voucher assistance is integrated into holistic and cross-sectoral programming that includes case management as well as referral systems. For example, a cash transfer delivered through case management might be able to help address aspects of gender-based violence response when core GBV response services such as health or legal services are not accessible to a survivor due to financial barriers. In this case, cash can be considered instrumental to a survivor's recovery. And while protection cash or cash for protection and the use of cash and voucher assistance to achieve protection outcomes are terms which are increasingly being used by humanitarian practitioners, there's still a lack of common understanding around these concepts and also an absence of a common policy and operational framework. So efforts are needed to understand which forms of cash and voucher assistance, for example, conditional and unconditional, as well as restricted and unrestricted transfers, as well as ways of delivering cash and vouchers, such as ATM cards, mobile money, e-vouchers, et cetera, are best suited for which types of protection programming. And this plays into effective program design. We also need to understand more about the optimal complementary protection services, which are necessary to reach longer term protection outcomes. Understanding this will bring about more effective program design as well. So what are the key takeaways from the GBV mapping? I'll share a few top line takeaways, but invite you all to dive into, into the paper as well as the executive summary. There's a persistence 
excuse me, persistent poor practice, um, which is undercutting the potential of cash and voucher assistance to contribute to gender based violence outcomes. So what do I mean by that? There's poor coordination between cash and GBV practitioners. There's a failure to integrate cash and GBV programming and also a failure to conduct ongoing gender and protection analyses. We need to know more about excluded and marginalized populations. So what are the impacts of cash and voucher assistance for the most excluded and marginalized groups of GBV survivors and individuals at risk for women with disabilities, older women, married and unmarried adolescent girls and persons with diverse sexual orientations and gender identities? What are the specific barriers and enablers of cash and voucher assistance for GBV outcomes? Are they different for different groups? Uh, what are the key takeaways from the child protection mapping? I'll share a few top line takeaways here. The supply side limitations, such as school facilities and qualified teachers, are crucial to cash and voucher assistance having a positive impact on child protection, and this requires a multifaceted and coordinated approach. In addition, we require more comparative evaluations to learn across contexts and CVA modalities if conditions tied to cash and voucher assistance for caregivers can have a significant impact on the well being of children, and if so, to learn which conditions are most effective. Next slide, please. So, what are the actions we need to take? First, we need to break down silos between cash and voucher assistance and protection actors through mutual capacity building and improved coordination on cash and voucher assistance for protection. The protection sector should proactively be reaching out to cash working groups where they exist for ongoing dialogue through local, national, and international fora. And on the other hand, the cash community needs to better engage with protection colleagues as well. Stakeholders should endorse and adapt the existing guidance and tools to align with organizational processes and establish their use in policies and protocols. Second, we need to build local actors capacity in cash and voucher assistance and meaningfully engage local partners expertise in the protection context. In doing so, they will be able to assist other stakeholders to identify opportunities to use cash and voucher assistance for protection outcomes. Third, we must develop clear eligibility criteria and harmonize targeting and implementation approaches of cash for protection activities at both the country and sector level. Fourth, to support institutionalization of cash and voucher assistance for protection as a standard aspect of humanitarian response, practitioners should be including cash for protection within donor proposals based on context-specific assessments. And on the other hand, donors need to resource cash and voucher assistance for protection outcomes, both the protection programming and the related startup costs of integrating cash and voucher assistance, such as additional staffing and capacity building. Fifth and last but not least, we must conduct more research on cash and voucher assistance for protection outcomes across all the areas of responsibility. We need rigorous, ethical, longer-term evidence that adheres to principles of do no harm. Thank you, Andreas. Back to you. Thank you very much, Tenzin. Um, I would now like to invite our, our second panelist, Monica Ferro, who is the director uh, of the Geneva office of UNFPA, to take the floor. Uh, Monica, the gender-based mm -hmm. violence uh, area of responsibility, which is uh, part of the global protection uh, cluster, was instrumental in gathering good practices of using cash and vouchers for improved protection outcomes. What are uh, some of the ways in which cash and vouchers can contribute to GBV risk mitigation and uh, improved responses to GBV survivors? survivors. Can you can you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I have been having problems with my computer. Thank you, Andres, for uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for introducing um, so well the work of the FPA and our specific position. And I would like to start um, to thank also the organizers for putting up um, such an interesting panel um, that really provides, in our view, um, a broad perspective on the main issues that are on the, the key issues that are discussed in the, in the paper. And um, and I would like to start, if um, if I may, just by um, thanking on behalf of NFPA, but also saying that 
due to the to the fact that uh, we are this dual mandated agency, we work on norms, but we work on implementation, and also that the um, that we work uh, with the sexual reproductive health team under the health cluster, which is relevant for this discussion also, and that we lead the GBVAOR under the protection cluster, as Andres just just referred to. This systematic and intense work that we do um, in advocacy for human rights and um, adopting a human rights based approach in all programming we do and um, the constant uh, fight for sexual productive health and rights and also fighting the multiple and intersectional discriminations as Tenzin uh, just referred and it's referred also in the stock paper in the stock taking paper and it's it's by working the full spectrum of rights and choices that our vision is shaped and that our work um, understanding how cash and voucher assistance really works for um, gender-based violence in uh, emergencies and sexual productive health in emergencies. And we are really uh, very much engaged in cash-based programming um, to facilitate access to, uh, to essential sexual productive health and GBV services in emergencies and also to contribute uh, to women and girls' well-being across a number of countries. And um, I can mention Jordan, Syria, Bangladesh, Mozambique, the DRC, and, and also, if you allow me a very contextualized reference to the, to the current uh, situation, during the, co the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been tirelessly working with government, humanitarian, private sector partners, so to understand, to deliver cash and vouchers uh, to vulnerable women and girls who have been affected by the closure of women's safe spaces, the reduced transportation and income losses, and so to allow them to access essential items and sexual productive health and GBV services. And we have also produced um, a COVID-19 guidance uh, note for cash in, uh, in those uh, specific programming areas, um, which we think was idly shared across the GBV and the cash communities of, of practice. But I will also share the link in the, in the chat box that we have here. And, and what we know, what we've, we've learned, and now it's uh, our starting point also, Andres, is that we know that cash and voucher assistance can contribute to the protection objectives, including access to sexual productive health and GBV, but also to prevention, to response. And at the same time, it puts women uh, at, at the center of decision-making uh, power. And, and while um, the evidence based on CVAs for women's health and protection in emergency countries uh, continues to grow, we all know and we've heard from Gain that learning from the field um, suggested that this, uh, the couch and voucher um, um, assistance can support protective outcomes for women and girls if and if it's well designed and part of a comprehensive case management, service delivery, and other support. What these emergency cash transfers have shown us is that um, they help women at risk of GVV or survivors of GVV to escape to escape from perpetrators, to access safe housing, um, to reduce the indirect costs related to medical care, psychological support, or transport. And we have found that the strategy, uh, the delivery uh, on the cash and vouchers really offers an opportunity to share important messages, messaging on COVID-19 related issues, GBV and health services uh, available for women, and GBV referral pathways, and I'm going to give you an example, in shops, through text messaging, and in ATM machines. So we know that CVA can contribute very effectively to protection, to protection objectives when, again, it's well integrated into protection and GBV programming. This means, of course, that we need to work more closely with local women's organizations, community health workers, case managers, and also other local actors who are on the front lines with women and girls. And this really provides us with a very concrete opportunity here to overlap with the localization lens and the grand bargain uh, commitments. And just to, um, to, to finalize on, uh, on with a couple of notes with, uh, with, with the result of the stock uh, taking paper, it's really focused on the contribution of CVA to protection sector outcomes. While it highlights the linkages between cash and uh, protection, it's very clear that they are not limited to protection-oriented programming. And um, and what what we want to um, to highlight is that there is still a great deal of work to be done in ensuring that protection risks 
and the protection risk analysis, sorry, informs CVA design, implementation, and monitoring. Evidence shows clearly that a lack of protection and GBV risk analysis can risk stigma, tension, or even violence against women who receive CVA. Eshen voucher assistance is a unique tool in the humanitarian box, but just like all of our assistance services and other work with crisis um, affected communities, it really requires a do no harm and protection lens. And what this means is that we have, we must have a stronger gender protection and GBV risk analysis and also adopt, adopt the necessary mitigation uh, managers. It's not an exercise to be stored in a file, but it's an analysis in which women and girls, um, they feel, um, they feel they can fit into local risks um, and mitigation measures and also informs program uh, design. So a protection lens should be community-based and we've been making that point very strongly. Women and girls should be able to give their inputs to design and implementation about, and their preferences should be taken into account. It cannot be just a talk shop. It has to translate into, um, into changes when we hear their voices. And also the ODI annual report on the grand bargain found that cash programming continues to be scaled up and that cash has the potential to bring transformative change to the humanitarian system. Uh, however, we know that as cash and voucher existence, assistance expands, protection and GBV risk analysis become even uh, more important. What needs to be done is that we need to continue to bridge the protection at CVA communities to ensure that all CVA research as reaches, sorry, those further behind, especially as CVA increasingly replaces uh, some sectoral uh, assistance. So as in all programming, CVA should aim to reach those left furthest behind and those who face intersecting and heightened risks uh, of GBA, of GBV, as it was mentioned, um, all the women, adults and girls with a disability, just to mention, um, just mention two of them. So just as the GPC and its AORs, as well as the protection clusters and subclusters in the field, advocate for the inclusion of the most vulnerable women and youth persons, uh, the women youth persons with disabilities, and all the persons across all the humanitarian programming. It's also very important to keep the same inclusion in mind when we are um, considering the multi-purpose cash assistance. So the GBV AOR, um, led by UNFPA is rolling out guidance and support for GBV subclusters and working groups in the field so that GBV coordinators are prepared to advocate for targeting uh, that includes those most in need for protection for whom cash and voucher assistance can be life-saving. The whole uh, mantra that we've developed around the Agenda 2030 that the Secretary General has been calling our attention constantly um, in the um, in, in the current circumstances of this pandemic that we are living, but, but, but that the mantra that it is leave no one behind can be, uh, please, can be really uh, uh, mainstreamed into this work. And I'm sorry if I took too long. I get very excited when I have to talk about this. Thank you, Andres, and sorry for exceeding my time. Thank you very much for that, uh, Monica. Uh, let us now move to our last panelist, who is Modar Al Mohammad. Uh, uh, Modar is the Senior Protection Manager at the IRC, the International Rescue Committee. Uh, Modar, I understand that you will draw on a, on a practical example in Syria. Uh, my question to you would be, the following what do you think is the biggest benefit of cash in protection programming uh, compared to traditional uh, protection assistance yeah uh, thanks andreas uh, like for for us cash for protection allows individuals to meet uh, immediate needs that are beyond the basic needs met by other multi-purpose cash assistance delivery and a protection response to increase the coping capacity of individuals or families facing unexpected and significant shocks. Yeah, uh, as said, my name is Mudal Muhammad. I'm uh, with IRC and uh, I'm going to provide you an, a short insight into our cash transfer programming for protection outcomes. Uh, like we're 
operating in a really very challenging context. It is an active conflict zone with a lot of barriers to accessing services and prolonged and multiple displacement. Next, please. Yeah, using cash to support protection outcomes is intended to help the clients address or mitigate protection risks or promote access to essential services for a specific need. Next, please. Uh, our transfer value is determined on a case-by-case -case basis by a committee uh, consists of protection staff and DRD staff. And the transfer value is ranging from 50 to 500 US dollars. And it is delivered within 48 to, 70, uh, to 72 hours in emergency. And we're targeting IDPs and host community members with protection concerns. We're not targeted by other cash assistance and who can be who can obtain a tangible protection benefit from a cash transfer. Next, please. Yeah, uh, here we can see some examples of protection needs which IRC attempts to cover with cash, like transportation to access services, imminent risk of eviction, modification of existing shelter, um, livelihood support for vulnerable heads of households, relocation due to protection concerns, sudden financial shock and assistive devices. Uh, like, for example, one-time injection can support shelter modifications or purchase repair of an assistive device that allow a person with mobility restrictions uh, or other impairment to have a greater ability to move around their home and feel safe to be an equal participant as other family members. Also, like uh, for sudden shock, to, uh, to the family that can strain resources and make it difficult for family to either pay for rent or basic necessities. One-time injection can support easy shelter modifications, including doors, locks, toilets, curtains, sheets, to create uh, a safer space for especially, especially female residents. And in every case, uh, other referrals and services like information and basic PSS, uh, like uh, first psychological first aid, are provided as well to ensure clients receive holistic support for all needs they have, uh, and thereby also ensuring the success of the cash assistance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Modar. Um, and uh, thank you. My thank you to goes to all speakers uh, who have uh, shared uh, their vision and provided their insights into this important new emerging uh, uh, area of work. Um, allow me to say that what, what I gather from this uh, round of, uh, of interventions is that you have highlighted the, the importance of cash uh, on protection outcomes and uh, the areas where opportunities can be found. Um, you have highlighted that cash and vouchers can support um, protect protection uh, outcomes if they are well designed and they are an integral part of a comprehensive uh, approach. Uh, and you have also uh, underlined the, the uh, responsibility of donors and organizations uh, in that respect, including their grant bargain uh, commitments on cash. In terms of next steps now, uh, we need to, to, to see uh, more uh, practical examples and, and how um, how lessons uh, can be learned uh, to further uh, the, the implementation of cash uh, for protection uh, outcomes. Um, we will take uh, questions now and comments from the floor. And I, uh, this is now for Manisha to lead uh, on. Uh, Manisha, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andreas, and thank you to all our presenters. We have a bit shorter time than expected in terms of our questions and answers, but hopefully we can get some in. 
I'm going to ask you to please raise your hands if you'd like to take the floor or please put your questions in the chat box. And I see we've already got one from Catherine who is asking Modara, um, how does this broad information provisioning to the relevant community members and not only targeted households work? If the transfer amount or entitlement is decided on case by case and individual need, does this not create further tension and possibly protection risks if other community members are unclear about who would receive what entitlement on which basis? I'm going to see if we have a couple of questions before I can turn back to the panelists and ask for your inputs. Does anybody else have any questions or comments that they'd like to share? Our speakers have all been so comprehensive that they've answered all your questions in advance. Oh, Marisol, please. Um, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Ellen. Marisol, do you want to take the floor? Please keep your questions quite short, though, please. Hi. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so the first question is for the example um, from Syria. Do we have any example about delivery of cash programming in and you know data protection problems? How do we assess? I know that in the stock um, uh, taking stock paper, we suggest to go with the risk matrix from the global protection cluster. But do we have any example considering that I'm particularly interested in the uh, programming in the you know based in Damascus. And then and a second question is, um, in my experience, let's say the cash for protection is implemented, especially as a one-off kind of intervention or injection, as we have heard also from our colleague from um, IRC. But to some extent, it, it looks like one-off interventions is more appropriate for an emergency or let's say life-saving kind of operation. But when the crisis changes uh, the contextual or let's say the operational setting into a more early recovery or social cohesion kind of programming, uh, do we have any evidence or similar paper that um, shows how more effective it could be the cash intervention if it would be more medium or longer term? Or do we stick to the evidence for one-off injection? Thank you very much. Thank you, Marisol. We have a few questions in the chat box as well. Uh, Modar, you're getting most of the questions. From Emmanuel, uh, could you let us know how the individuals and the communities were involved in the design of your CBA program, including the determination of the value you transfer? And there's also one from Lara, how were protection outcomes measured and how much time, ha time had lapsed from the distribution of cash and when they were measured? Were the impact short term or could any longer term effects be observed? I'm also going to ask the other panelists to come back on those. I'm just going to go to S. Batan, who's got his or her hand up. If you could ask your question very briefly, please, S. Batan. Hi. Yes, Stefano from Vorto. I hope you can hear me well. Um, the question is about the targeting. It would be interesting to know a little bit more about the process uh, through which the clients are targeted in the IRC example as well as uh, the post distribution monitoring. I guess uh, it, this overlaps with Lara's question. Uh, it would be interesting if uh, Modar could share more details about the, the monitoring of the outcomes. Super, thank you very much. You. We've also got a question from Emmanuel as a follow-up, I believe, to the other question. You also said that you managed to transfer cash was within the first 72 hours of a crisis. This would only be this would be only in the case where you had the ID of the people affected, right? In a situation like the recent explosion in Beirut, has your team there managed to deliver some CBA that quickly? We've also got a question from Sarah Martin. Uh, what is a concrete way to break down the silos between cash and protection? This is a common problem with cross-cutting issues. Like having more meetings, what can we do? Maybe Tenzin, that's one that you could take. And then what mechanisms have been put in place to ensure women or adolescent girls benefiting from cash are not further exposed to intimate partner violence as a result? Monica, you may also want to come on in on that. But Yasmin had her hand up and we had also, but, uh, Yasmin, I'm gonna give you the floor and then I'm gonna come back to our presenters and ask if you can come back to have answers on those before I turn back to Andreas so we can wrap up on time. Yasmin, please. 
Okay, thank you. I just want to make a comment uh, about uh, the I, the uh, delivery of cash assistance based on a rigorous analysis and part of a more comprehensive package. Because uh, I work in Yemen and we have seen that uh, in many cases we had uh, one-off cash assistance given just on the analysis of vulnerability and not of a definite protection risk. And it, it proved not to be very uh, impactful because at the end of the day, if someone has a disability, a one-off assistance will not change his or her situation. So also like uh, on, on the point of the misconception or the lack of common uh, understanding of what is uh, cash for protection, it also links a lot uh, to our understanding of vulnerabilities and how to, uh, to, to address them. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We also have a comment from Nadia before I'm going to turn back to the to the panelists. Uh, as Tenzin said, selection criteria for cash assistance is very important. The right staff, for example, social workers with a GBV or child protection background are my recommendation, and that's from Nadia. Modar, I'm going to maybe turn to you first, if that's okay, since a lot of those questions were really directed to you about some very specific elements around your presentation in terms of creating further tension, possible risks, how were communities and individuals involved, how were the protection outcomes measured in terms of time, and were you able to do things in the short term? And then I'm going to come back to the other panelists. Odara, please. Yes, thanks for all the questions. Yeah, start, uh, I start first with the procedures, like how do we identify how we start with cash, like uh, our protection monitoring teams do uh, household visits as part of their normal monitoring work. If uh, protection assistance believes that there is someone in the household who has a specific protection need based on the assessment conducted that can be met by cash flow protection, uh, then they will fill out an assessment form uh, specific for cash and share it with their uh, office-based focal point. Protection focal point will ensure that the forms have been correctly filled and uploaded in the system, like we're using the uh, home care, so it's uh, safe and uh, all the data is secure. Then the form will be sent to, uh, this is in Syria and we're sitting in Amman, so the forms will be sent to the cash committee that sits in Amman for review. And uh, Amman committee will review uh, the cases on a weekly basis and uh, decide if this will receive cash or other referrals, and if so, uh, what amount is appropriate? Um, for the uh, second question on uh, the monitoring part, like before, during, and after the cash transfer, uh, RC protection monitoring team, a company client, and ensure every type of assistance is provided in a timely manner. And in every, in every case, uh, other referrals and services are provided as well to ensure clients receive holistic support. And uh, for uh, any kind of program, uh, post monitoring, uh, post distribution monitoring for cash is conducted by our meal uh, team uh, in approximate 30 days after uh, each cash transfer. And uh, IRC's uh, feedback and response mechanism enables community members, including beneficiaries and non-beneficiaries, to contact the IRC confidentially to raise any suggestions and concerns regarding IRC's programming. Super, thank you very much, Modar. And I think you did a great job of answering those very particular questions around how you did the programming and highlighting the emphasis of really taking the time to involve people. Can I maybe turn to uh, Monica in terms of coming back, particularly on some of those questions around ensuring that you've got staff with the right background or how you can also ensure that cash does not result in the further exposure to intimate pa intimate partner violence? Thank you, Manisha. Um, I think that uh, Modar um, already um, made my life easy because you, you, you spoke to so many things that, that are relevant, but if, let me be um, telegraphic so that I can um, so that I can share the most relevant things. I think the first thing we need to do, um, answering specifically to your, cash, to your questions, it's really to implement uh, mechanisms that allow for a meaningful, a meaningful participation of women and girls in risk analysis. And this, as you know, include 
organizing um, meetings where they can um, sit comfortably. But this, this requires, of course, as you were saying, a proper analysis of the cultural and the specific context in order not to expose them further when they are participating in this in this type of initiatives. And then we need to identify what are the locally relevant mitigation mechanisms and identify the key people um, that, are, that make sure that, that this mitigation mechanisms can translate into proper measures. And then, of course, strong monitoring and feedback mechanisms. And it's, it's super relevant, uh, the fact that we can have feedback from the own beneficiaries of, um, of, our, of our program. And of course, this has to lead to um, a, a more agile, um, the possibility to quickly adapt um, the program that we are that we are that we are developing. We all know that um, there's no one size fits all. We've mentioned many times, and I think all the the speakers mentioned that this is not um, a tool that will work per se alone. It's a tool that has to be integrated. But um, but those would really re be my uh, my main points. You know, starting from what you said, personnel who are clearly trained. To understand the, the context and the, and and the circumstances in which we are acting, and then participation, mitigation, monitoring, and adaptation. Those would be my my key points. Thank you, Manisha. Super. Thank you very much, Monica. That's excellent. Maybe Tenzin, I will turn to you, and then maybe Bernadette or William, you can come in with any responses on anything that you've heard in terms of questions that you'd like to answer, or any other final thoughts before I turn back to Andreas, please. Absolutely, thanks. So in terms of the question around breaking down silos, these silos are both within our own agencies and also across communities of practice. So we need to have more intentional um, intentional leadership uh, to make sure that we're collaborating appropriately. And capacity building is really essential. As I said in my um, remarks, we need to have kind of basic level competency in the other cohorts um, modalities and, and methods to be able to identify those key opportunities so we can leverage cash and voucher assistance for protection outcomes. Um, and there are many trainings available that we can go ahead and apply uh, immediately. Um, there's the ERC cash and protection training. There is the cash and GBV compendium training. Um, while these are both in-person trainings and currently access is an issue, these can be uh, modified for online form online formats um, and modular to fit into the busy days of, of uh, field-based colleagues. Um, Monica spoke to this a, a bit as did Modar, but in terms of, of targeting, it is really essential that um, this process is, is led through the case management process. Um, and there are available tools such as the WRC IRC Mercy Corps toolkit um, and, and others as well that assist GBV case managers to identify with the GBV survivor, um, centering their experience, their choice around what assistance they, they want to take advantage of, um, whether or not cash assistance can, can be helpful. And the starting point needs to be not assuming that cash is appropriate or that it isn't, um, but speaking to the individual within a case management context. Um, and as that is led by the case manager, confidentiality, survivor-centered approach can be adhered to and information can be shared as relevant and de-identified with cash actors to then tailor the, the cash response uh, where referrals are appropriate. Um, lastly and briefly, uh, there were a lot of questions, but one regarding um, uh, multi-year um, funding or the opportunity to provide transfers in greater amounts over a longer period of time um, within protection case management. And this absolutely is a, a critical gap. Um, WRC's past experience with care in, in Ecuador, our findings were that uh, we indeed needed to provide longer term um, cash and voucher assistance in, in greater amounts um, with a longer duration, um, but we need support from donors in order to create those multi-year uh, opportunities through which then we can also um, examine and, and build evidence around those longer term impacts. Over, thanks. Super, thank you very much. William or Bernadette, either of you wanna come in? There was also a question that came in while you were speaking, Tenzin, about how we can ensure that women and girls benefiting from cash assistance are not exposed to further harm or protection risks, which I think, Monica, you answered quite well. But William or Bernadette, either of you would like to take the floor before I 
quickly wrap up and hand back to summarize, uh, sorry, to Andreas to summarize and close. No. Okay. <laughs> We'll leave it at that then. So huge thanks to those of you who asked the questions and I think you got some excellent responses from Modar, Tenzin and Monica. And I think it was very clear that as many of you said, we need to really break down those silos that currently exist between the different areas of work that we're in and different ways of working. But as Grania also said at the beginning, we need to make sure that cash is complementary with other forms of assistance, but we also need to very much involve individuals and communities to make sure that we understand what their needs are, figure out how we respond best, and make sure that we're not putting them at further harm. So really ensuring that we look at local mitigation measures that are already there, working with those, but making sure that we involve women and girls throughout, but also other individuals within communities so that we are able to identify who amongst the communities at risk are the ones that are able to receive cash and voucher assistance that will complement protection outcomes. I know we have probably many more questions, but this is really just the launch of a series of events. So hopefully the paper itself will give you lots of more exciting ideas. And with that, thank you to the panelists. Andreas, I'm gonna hand back to you please for a, a last summary and closing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manisha. Um, we are approaching the end of this uh, launch event, uh, which has been, uh, uh, very fruitful. Uh, I want to thank uh, all uh, all uh, speakers for uh, their insights and approaches, and uh, the participants for their their questions and active interest in this uh, thrilling uh, topic. We are very pleased to have been uh, part of this launch, and uh, and now we look forward to next step steps as as you said manisha this is the beginning of a journey in a new area of work and um and as the stock taking paper and the speakers have highlighted uh, today there is still a lot of work uh, ahead um we need uh first of all to break down the silos i th i think that was um uh, uh the, the common thread of of many uh, interventions between uh the cash and protection uh, actors we we need to continue to learn more about the advantages of uh, cash and vouchers for protection uh, including by by distinguishing the two modalities as well as uh by addressing gaps and for the uh for the European Union's humanitarian aid department for, for DG ECHO, cash should be prioritized over, over vouchers and in-kind whenever possible, uh, uh, since it offers dignity and uh, flexibility to beneficiaries. And uh, cash is usually, the key word is usually, more efficient than other modalities uh, of aid. We also need to learn more uh, about targeting approaches. We also need to learn more about the different ways that cash and protection uh, can be related. For instance, integrating cash into case management, so integrating cash into a protection response, or, uh, or multi-purpose cash assistance based on protection uh, sensitive targeting to help reduce uh, negative coping mechanisms. So in a nutshell, more prevention. And most importantly, all learning, all learning uh, needs to be strongly grounded in experiences from the field. And uh, as we saw today, we have already uh, good, uh, good uh, experiences that we can build on from uh, crisis uh, zones uh, in the world. What will be more, uh, even more important to keep in mind as the evidence has highlighted so far is that cash alone is unlikely to achieve meaningful long-term protection outcomes. That could happen, that could happen if, if it is integrated into a holistic programming that includes uh, case management and referral systems. In other, uh, in other words, we must keep focusing on the fact that when cash is integrated in protection, there must be a clear protection outcome. In this sense, uh, I welcome very much the, the conclusion 
that we need to conduct more research on cash for protection outcomes. Um, I understand that further events will be uh, organized and scheduled, uh, and there will be uh, opportunities to uh, address outstanding issues and questions. And uh, these events will be announced on the website of the Global Protection uh, Cluster, and uh, the link will be uh, included in, uh, in the chat box uh, today. Um, allow me to extend a very warm thank you to all participants, to all our great speakers, and wish you a very pleasant afternoon. Thank you to all.